This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Runner. And today I'm standing in front of a giant oven in the gel factory outside of Moscow. And this week I've been looking at the whole process of how they make this beautiful blue and white Russian porcelain. That porcelain has been in this oven for 48 hours where the temperatures have been as high as 1,300 degrees. And now we're going to see the door opened to see what's been cooked in the fire. Etic Devai. Let's open the oven door. Look at the size of this door. Of course, the temperatures are very, very hot. And once the door is open, we get a peek at treasures. Russian blue and white porcelain. Look at this. It is so heavy. They have to transport it back and forth into the oven and out of the oven on railroad tracks. And when you look at what is inside, it is amazing. And I can feel still the heat coming out of this oven. But look at it. It's so spectacular. And to think it began as clay in the earth, which was liquefied, poured into molds, cleaned, blemishes cut off, excess removed, dipped to see if there were any faults, any fractures or cracks, then marvelously painted, then hidden by glaze, and finally brought here to the oven. And the hottest temperature of all was required to bring out the richness of the blue and the shininess of each piece. That is just remarkable. And my friends, I want to tell you that if you've been through fire, and there's all kinds of fires in life, sometimes there are fires which are sent from the enemy, sometimes there are fires that we set ourselves, and sometimes God puts us through fires to make us strong. They're never bad fires. It's just what we need to be, what we need to be. God gives us what we need to be to cook us and to make us the best peace we can be for his service in the kingdom of God. And that's what I think about when I look at this beautiful gel. And that is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. This is Rick Renner, and I've been waiting for you. And today, I'm going to continue talking to you about the fire of God in your life. But hey, how did you like the introduction to today's program where I showed you me standing in front of the oven when they brought all of those gorgeous pieces of Russian porcelain out of the fire. You know, fire really adds a lot of color to our lives. And today I'm going to be giving you part of my testimony about how some fiery experiences brought color to my life. And those experiences still impact me today. They were very necessary in my life, though I did not enjoy it at the time that I was in the oven. But hey, I'm offering you my brand new series, which is called The Fire of God in Your Life. You know, there's a bad fire, which the enemy sends. It ravages, it destroys, but then there is a holy fire which comes from the presence of God, and it is a refining fire that makes us better, and that is what this series is about, the fire of God. The subtitle says, The Benefits of Embracing God's Fiery Presence, and it comes with a wonderful study guide, so you can read all the points and all the principles, everything in the series, while you're seeing it or while you are hearing it. And today only, we're offering you my book called A Life Ablaze for Free, just one per household, but if you'll write to us or give us a call, we'll get it right to you. And my friends, it's a substantial book, so this is quite a gift, but I really want to sow it into your life because... I want you to be a life ablaze. Maybe you started in the fire of God, but somehow over time, it seems like you lost what you once have. How do you rekindle the flames? That's what this book is about. The 10 simple keys to live on fire for God all of your life. God wants you to be a life 
ablaze. And today only, it's our gift to you if you'll call us or if you'll write us right now. And I want to remind you that when you reach out to us, we want to know how to pray for you. Jesus said, if two or three of you were to gather together and agree about anything, I will do what you ask. Well, here we are. We're waiting for you to reach out to us. We'll agree with you in prayer. Jesus will do his part. He will do what we ask. He's waiting to perform a miracle for you right now. So let us know how to pray for you by calling us or by sending us an email. But today we're going to return to our theme verse for this series, which is called The Fire of God in Your Life. But the theme verse is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, where the Apostle Paul describes his experience with a fiery presence of God that cooked him and prepared him for ministry. And he writes in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And we've seen every day this week that this verse is just jam-packed filled with revelation. And the King James translators didn't do such a good job on this verse. So let's look at these words a little more deeply. Let's begin the very first verse four, where he says, as we were allowed of God. We've seen that that word allowed is the Greek word dokimazo, which means to test, examine, inspect, or to scrutinize. So you could translate it, we were tested of God, examined of God, inspected of God, even scrutinized of God, but this word allowed, the Greek word dokimazo, was used to determine the quality or the sincerity of a product or of a thing. And because the object scrutinized finally passed the test, it could be viewed as genuine and sincere and ready to be used. And this word allowed, the Greek word dokimazo, was used to illustrate the test used to determine real and counterfeit coinage. And after a scrutinizing test of fire was used, the fire would reveal which coinage was real and which was counterfeit. But most importantly, this word allowed, the Greek word dokimazo was used to picture the refining of metal by fire to remove its impurities. Now, I know that none of us like fiery experiences, but aren't you glad that they put metal through fire? Because the fire exposes all the defects. If they use the metal without that purifying process, it would have hidden defects that would later hurt all of us. The fire is necessary to remove impurities. First, the metal was placed in a fire that burned at a certain degree of heat. Then they turned up the heat into a second blaze. And finally, they turned it up a third time. It was placed in a blazing fire that burned at the highest degree of all. This is where we get the phrase, would you please stop putting me through the third degree? That's really where it came from. But all three such tests were needed in order to remove from the metal all the unseen impurities that were hidden from the naked eye. From the viewpoint of the naked eye, the metal probably looked strong and ready to be used even prior to those tests. But unseen defects were resident in the metal that would have shown up later as a break a fracture, or some kind of malfunction. I'm thinking about people who are mightily gifted, but they began their career or they began their ministry before those defects had been dealt with in their life. And because those defects had never been submitted to the fiery presence of God later in life, when they became more well-known, suddenly those defects showed up and it didn't just hurt them, it hurt a lot of people that were following them. This fire of God that I'm describing saves us and it also protects others. But before a person could be assured that the metal was free of defects and thus ready to be used, these three purifying tests at different degrees of blazing hot fire were required. The fire was hot, the process was lengthy, but the tests were necessary in order to achieve a good product. And I know that you want to be a good product that God is ready to use. And therefore, God wants to put you through some fiery experiences to cook you and make you what you need to be. I'm not talking about disastrous things like sickness or disease or bankruptcy. These are things sent by the enemy. I'm talking about refining fires that make us better. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in this verse, as we were allowed of God, tested of God. Of is the Greek word hoopa, which means by, directly by, 
This word hupo can also be translated under as under the guidance of. And here Paul says, it was God himself who was orchestrating these events in my life before I could be put in trust with the gospel. God dealt with those flaws before Paul was launched into his public ministry. And then he adds, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. And guess what? The word trieth is again the continuous form of the Greek word dokimazo, which means the test never ends. You may think you've come through one test, but before you go to the next level, God will make sure you're prepared for that level as well. And that's why the verse really means. It was a lengthy process, and I went through a lot of refining fires to get me to this place. But I finally passed the test, and God saw that I was genuinely ready but it's not over yet because God is still testing our hearts to see if we're ready for the next big step. And I've given you the example of the Apostle Paul, who when he was saved was instantly anointed to be an apostle, but he wasn't ready to be launched into his ministry. In fact, Paul's character was so raw, he had to really be put through some fires to be refined before he could begin his ministry. And when you come to Acts chapter 9, we read about his character when he first got saved. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 26 says, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, that's the Apostle Paul, who earlier was referred to as Saul. He essayed to join himself to the disciples. Well, he'd been a big man among the Jews. Now he's a Christian. So he assumed that he ought to instantly be a big man among the Christians. And even though God had never dealt with the defects in his life, he essayed to join the disciples. He wanted to be a big man in the church instantly, but his character was filled with problems. God had to change his character before he could gain a public position in the church. And in fact, he was so raw in his character that the Bible says in verse 26 that the disciples were afraid of him and didn't even believe that he was a disciple. They weren't sure he was really even saved because he was so rough and so raw in his character. But one man believed in him, and that was Barnabas, and Barnabas brought him to the apostles and introduced him. But when you come down to verse 29, you find something interesting about his character. It says, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, that sounds good, but well, wait, hold on. And disputed, the word dispute really means to argue. He argued against the Grecians, and they went about to slay him. And then verse 30 says, which when the brethren knew of it, which means the leadership of the church didn't know what he was doing. He was acting on his own, not under spiritual authority. He didn't even understand spiritual authority because he was a new believer. And when the believer, when the leadership in Jerusalem heard about it, they brought him down to Caesarea, put him on a boat and sent him home to Tarsus. And the next verse immediately says, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. When they got him out of town, finally, they could breathe a sigh of relief. We're talking about the great legendary Apostle Paul. But when he first came to Christ, he was rough in his character. His mind was unrenewed. And he created such a ruckus in the church, the leadership put him on a boat and sent him home. And only then could they breathe a sigh of relief. And where did he go? He went eventually to the city of Antioch, which I know was a fiery experience for him. And we read about this in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. And this is so very important. It's an example of how you can read a text and not really understand it unless you pause to think about it. Well, when you come to Acts chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manion, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And I write about all of these men in my book called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success, which has to do with you being prepared for what God wants you to do. But most of these men were not theologically trained. For example, Barnabas, even though he was a Jew, he had not been theologically trained. The Bible talks about Simeon that was called Niger. The word Niger means black. This was a black man from North Africa, and most scholars believe it probably was a slave. Then Lucius of Cyrene, 
Cyrene. Cyrene was from northern Africa. This is a man that had moved to Antioch from Africa. He may have also been a black man and may have also been a slave. And then we read about Mannion, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. This was actually a relative of Herod. Mannion was a pagan. He was a Roman. And as a Roman, he had been taught not to like the Jews, to despise them. And finally, we have Saul in the list. Saul is the only one theologically trained, and now he finds himself as a co-equal leader among others who have no theological training. And wait, not only that, being raised as a Jew, he was told to have no contact with pagans whatsoever, with Gentiles, and he finds himself on a team filled with Gentiles. <laughs> Simeon, is a Gentile. Lucius is a Gentile. Mannion is a Gentile. Barnabas is a Jew, but he's not theologically trained. And Paul is the only one that has insight to the Old Testament scriptures. And now he finds himself as a co-equal leader among others, learning to submit to them, to respect to them. Now, you may wonder how long he sat on the same bench with these other men in the city of Antioch. And the answer is about eight years. Wow. If you just read Acts 13, 1 without digging a little deeper, it seems that these events occurred very quickly, but they did not. Paul sat in that church for eight years. And during those eight years, he had to learn to respect Gentiles who were now saved. During those eight years, he had to learn to respect people who didn't have his same educational status. He had to submit to them, listen to them, work with them, be a co-laborer with them. And surely it must have been a fire to his soul. And I'm sure there were moments when he said, will I ever get out of here? When will the day come when I finally be launched into my own ministry? He probably had his eye on the clock. Do you have your eye on the clock? Do you know that God is not a clock watcher? He has lots of time. God is not a clock watcher. He is a character watcher. And God was looking at Saul's character. A fire was there. He was placed into the oven to cook him, to remove excess, and to make him strong and make him ready for ministry. And when God finally saw that his character had been refined and that he was strong enough the Bible tells us in verse 3, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. I'm sure Paul said, hip, hip, hooray, the moment has finally come. But maybe it would have come earlier if he had embraced the holy fire that had come to refine him. How long we stay in the fire depends on our response to it. And yesterday, I told you about an early experience in my life of fire, and it was a fire that I really needed. I was a young man. I was learning to read the Greek New Testament and was really impressed with what I was learning. I knew that I was called. I knew that I was anointed, and I wanted to teach. And I went to the leadership of our church and told them how anointed I was and what a blessing it was that God sent me to that church at the university. They looked at me and said, Rick, we know that God really has anointed you and we believe you are to begin your ministry. And as I told you yesterday, they gave me the ministry of setting up the chairs and vacuuming the carpet. And eventually they promoted me into washing the dishes at the church. And I thought it was so below me, but I didn't realize it at the time. But God had put me in the oven and God was dealing with issues in me that needed to be removed. Finally, I said, Lord, I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to vacuum the carpet better than anybody has ever vacuumed. I'm going to set up those chairs in the most professional way. I'm going to make those dishes gleam by the time that I'm done with them. I prayed over those chairs. I prayed over those dishes. I prayed over that carpet. I embraced the moment. And guess what? It was a moment that I needed in my life. Because that fiery experience revealed things in my character that were not right. Pride, arrogance, impatience. That fire revealed all those things. And by keeping me in that temperature for a period of time, the Lord began to remove that excess from my life. But hey, that was not the last time I was going to be put through fire. And in fact, when you understand Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he says, it was a lengthy process and I went through a lot 
of refining fires to get me to this place, but I finally passed the test and God saw I was genuinely ready. Now listen to this part. And it's not over yet because God is still testing our hearts to see if we're ready for the next big step. And in the next program, I'm going to tell you about the Lord moving me from one oven to another oven because he needed to really prepare me for my future. And the greater your assignment, the greater the period of preparation. And rather than resist that period of preparation, embrace the holy, fiery presence of God and say, Lord, you are a consuming fire. So as I draw near to you, I'm asking that your fire would burn all the dross and all the slag out of my life and get me ready to be a vessel that can be used. That is why God puts you in the oven. It's not to hurt you, it's to help you, to remove your defects, to remove impurities that would later show up and hurt you or hurt somebody else. God loves you so much, he's cooking you and he's getting you ready for something magnificent. I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. Many people fear fiery experiences, but there is a good fire that we all need to keep burning in our lives. Fire sent from the enemy is destructive, but God sent fire is needed to make us stronger, pure, and ready for what God wants to do in and through our lives. Remember, the Bible says God is a consuming fire, and we need His fire to remain spiritually ablaze and burn red hot as we do our part to fulfill His great plan. In this life-transforming five-part series, Rick will show you how God's divine fire is needed to remove excess waste and make you stronger, reveal flaws that need to be corrected, make your life shine brighter, bring color to your life. This series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. And today only, get the book A Life of Blaze as our free gift to you. Just call the number on your screen or visit renner.org to request it. In this powerful book, Rick lays out everything you need to live an intimate and uncompromising life and to stay on fire with the Holy Spirit's power for years to come. You can do it, but you need to know how. And that's what you'll discover in this timely book. Learn the right fuels you need to throw into your spiritual fire to get you burning again. Get the book, A Life of Blaze, for free today. And don't miss this powerful series, The Fire of God in Your Life. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and today I want to give you a report about what's happening in the construction of our new studio. Work still continues. It's taken a little bit longer than we anticipated because of all the sanctions that have stopped materials from coming to Russia, but we're doing it step by step. And today they're installing the fireplace, which is going to be the centerpiece of this big room where we're going to be filming programs. But in addition to this, there's gonna be another set over here and another set over there. So many angles and opportunities to film teaching that people can trust in this room. But of course, this is just one room. But I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited about this room. To think that TV programs with the Word of God are going to be filmed right here. And when I look around this room, you can see this electrical grid, grid that's gonna hold all the lights. It's on electrical pulleys, so it goes up, it goes down. It's just going to have everything we need to film the teaching of the Word of God. But hey, there's more than this. Let me show you. Well, I know you can't tell from what it looks like right now, but this really is gonna be one of the smaller studios. And this is gonna be Denise's studio because Denise is reaching women everywhere with her programming. And right from this spot, Denise is going to be sending her teaching to women all over the world. But hey, there's another set in addition to this one. This is our third studio in this new building. You may say, why do you need three studios? Because we're filming a lot of programs. Right now, we can only film one program at a time. We have to set it up, take it down, but this will enable us to do multiple things at one time. But on both floors of this building, there are multiple offices. In fact, there are 18 offices, and in all of these offices, people are going to be doing editing, writing, producing programs, working with our network. It is amazing the activity that's going to take place in this building. And it's not about buildings, it's about people. 
People need the teaching of the Word of God. But it's your generous gifts that have helped us to build this, and we will complete it. But right now, we're in phase three of our ministry, which is paying off our Tulsa ministry headquarters. We want to pay it off, because the moment it's paid off, all of those funds will be released for us to broadcast the teaching of the Word of God around the world. And that's really our goal, to get the gospel and to teach people the Bible all over the world. They're just crying out for it, and they're waiting for that signal to come with the answer that they've been seeking. So please help us as we finish phase three to pay off the Tulsa facility. Well, today we have covered a lot of territory, and it has been so wonderful talking to you about the fire of God in your life. My friends, God loves you so much. He wants to prepare you for what's coming in your life. And he sends a holy refining fire to remove defects and impurities from our character. I'm not talking about destructive fires like cancer or some kind of bankruptcy or something terrible happening in a relationship. Those are fires sent from the enemy. I'm talking about a holy fire from God that comes to purify us and to refine us, the fire of God in your life. And when God sends that kind of holy fire to refine us, we need to embrace it. And that's why the subtitle says, The Benefits of Embracing God's Fiery Presence. God is a consuming fire. And as we draw near to Him, His presence begins to burn out of us all the things that could later affect us in a negative way. So embrace the fiery presence of God. And that series comes with a wonderful study guide, and I want you to have it. So you can go online to order the series and the study guide by giving us a call right now, or you can send us an email. And we're offering you today only for free my book, which is called A Life Ablaze, 10 Simple Keys to Living on Fire for God. But I want to pray for you right now. Father, thank you for your holy fire, which comes to purify us, to refine us, and to make us better. Help us not to resist it, but to embrace it. And Lord, we pray that you burn all the dross out of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been good today, but I can hardly wait to get back tomorrow. We're going to wrap it up. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, which says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.